when I was asked to do this Oxford translation workshop, I think the very, my very first thought was, well, you know, I have taught many workshops, translation workshops, but I actually don't know how translation works <laughs> in the brain. So um, my theory is that you already know how to translate especially this audience, I feel. Some of you will be heritage speakers. Some of you will have translated for your parents, for example, ever since you were a child. Um, some of you are in uh, multilingual relationships. And um, some of you may uh, translate for work. Some of you may have picked up a different language at some point, a foreign language at some point, and you are using it in your daily life somehow. And um, so, so some of you, I, I'm going to wager that almost all of you have translated something. It doesn't have to be a whole book, but um, it could be, you know, <clears throat> just a sentence or like some kind of like, uh, like a sentence and an ingredient, like, oh, what is that? And then you can't really explain what happens in your mind when, that ha uh, when, when you do that. We call translation more like, it, it feels more like there's a meaning and then you turn it into words which is what this little thing means here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm very nervous. Sorry that I'm like all over the place right now. <clears throat> so um, this little piece of advice here, don't translate, just say it. This is something that uh, my older brother, who is also bilingual, said to me when I was starting off as a translator, as a freelance translator in college. He was uh, part of, so he served in the military as a, um, as a language soldier. I don't know how to say it in English, and they are basically interpreters and translators uh, for, um, for uh, between the American forces uh, in Korea and the Korean forces. So my brother was part of the Korean army. We all have to serve, all men, healthy men have to serve in the Korean army for back then two, two years and two months. Now it's a year and a half, I believe. And he did it as a uh, language soldier. So he got to have a lot of like translation and interpreting experience. Whereas once I came out of the army and I did not do have any, use any English in the army, um, the Korean army, uh, by the time I got out and I was trying to make some money off of translation and interpreting, like I went to him for advice and, he, and I was like, so how do you do it? How do you translate one? one I, I, I know kind of how to do it, but I don't know how you do it. And he said, well, you don't do it. You just, you don't translate. You just say it in English. Like, don't think about it. And that don't think about it is basically what translation kind of comes down to for a lot of translators. My professor at, um, my professor at Yuhua, her name is uh, Hai Yun Zhang. She translated The Girl Who Wrote Loneliness by Kyung Suk Shin. She said that no one really knows how translation works. It's, a, it's like a black box subconscious process. It just happens in the brain. And indeed, when I am blocked as a translator, and this is a bit of professional advice, I try to make things around me as quiet as possible so that I can hear the translation. I can hear my subconscious pushing the translation up from the subconscious into the conscious. I read the Korean or the English, and then I kind of like wait for my mind to process it, and then it will spit it out. Or if it's a very thorny kind of translation or, or expression, I will go to sleep, I'll take a nap, or I'll just like put it off to the next day and then I'll wake up the next morning. And throughout the night, um, my subconscious would have untangled the translation for me. <clears throat> so um, that's basically translation, this very uh, mysterious process. But what is literary translation and what makes it different from normal translation? My theory about that is that there is no difference. Everything you do in technical translation and non-literary translation is exactly what you do in literary translation. You have to think about tone, you have to think about voice, you have to think about register, you have to think about your audience and where it is going. Really the only difference, and this is kind of a big difference, is that for pieces of literature, for example, like, uh, like an entire novel, you have to think in terms of extended metaphor and how form follows function. And so, like, for example, um, Beloved, greatest novel in, uh, that America has ever produced, Beloved by Toni Morrison. So you see a lot of, like, the story, the narrative uh, structure in Beloved kind of take on uh, slave narratives, like that cadence, uh, testimonials. Uh, and that's, of course, because, you know, the book is also, you know, about, partly about slavery. So uh, that's a kind of example of form-following function. So when you are translating 
a book, especially because a book will have, you know, it's like a fractal. If you go down to the sentence level, uh, there will be some kind of uh, correlation in terms of form when you go out into like the book level, like it will be like the, the, the sentence will be the same shape of the entire novel. And that's very kind of like an important uh, difference that literary translation has. Of course, arguably, for example, I was a legal translator and you have, in order to translate a contract, you need to know quite a lot of um, like constitutional law, criminal law and, you know, civil law and all of that. And that kind of like, that knowledge kind of like comes together in your translation of contract law. And so you can kind of argue that, well, literary translation is still the same, but um, uh, perhaps, uh, but literary translation is a bit more extreme even than uh, legal translation. I'm sure there are some legal translators who will see this and be very mad at me. Uh, but um, to kind of like illustrate my point, there's a very famous, well, there, there's a quote by Gregory Rabassa that uh, I kind of live by, and it's right here, it's down here, let me read it to you. It is a common notion to say that if a work has 10,000 readers, it becomes 10,000 different books. The translator is only one of these readers, and yet he must read the book in such a way that he will be reading the Spanish into English as he goes along, with the result that his reading is also writing. His reading then becomes the one reading that is going to spawn 10,000 varieties of the book in the unlikely case that it will sell that many copies and will be read by that many people. This is from his essay, The Many Faces of Treason. And so in other words, uh, a literary translation uh, gives birth, is, is very rich and it gives birth to many meanings, whereas something like a contract has to only give you one meaning. It's the, a contract is an agreement between two parties as to how something is going to, how we're we going to understand something. Whereas uh, a literary translation is perhaps like the opposite of that. So that is for me, the fundamental difference between literary translation and non-literary translation. Uh, can we scroll down just a little bit? Yes, oh, stop, that's fine, yes, great. So um, this, is the, this is the poem that we're going to use for this workshop and also for the next workshop. I'm going to basically provide you with a crib translation for this poem. And we're going to uh, work with it uh, in breakout rooms soon at the, at the end of my lecture. And then uh, for the second part of the lecture, which is, which is next week, or workshop, which is next week, I will uh, then um, critique uh, each, each translation and we'll have like a fruitful discussion about the different methods that different um, translators use. This is the most famous poem in all of Korean literature and it contains the most famous line in all of Korean literature. This is Azaleas by Kim so -ho. It was written during the Japanese occupation. So um, early 20th century. Um, just, let's just take a look at, uh, let's just take a look at like the, the, the photograph of the page on the right and the uh, kind of like the the words on the left what do you think like what are some differences that you can you can see you can kind of speak it into the chat if you like for for one thing yes directionality verticalization very excellent excellent so we used to write vertically in korea because um we we take our writing tradition basically from china and that's how they used to do it so that's how we used to do it until quite recently i think in the 90s even newspapers started to write um horizontally <clears throat> Very good. Hanta, there are Chinese characters. Um, there are Chinese characters on the left, but I think, I believe there are more on the right. Oh, no, they're not. Um, but this sort of letter looks like Hanta, right? It looks, for those of you who read Chinese, this kind of looks like a certain Chinese character, but it's actually a, an old Hangul character. Um, so like this word and this word looks different. They're actually the same word. They're actually in, in Hangul, Kot. So the left, on the left side, this is a modern uh, kind of, uh, I don't know what you call it. It's, I call it a translation. It's a translation of the poem on the right into modern Korean. Uh, and the reason I picked also, another reason I picked this poem to translate for our workshop is because I used to have a professor at LTI Korea uh, who, whose name I have mercifully forgotten. And he was convinced that no, it was impossible to translate this poem. He said, this poem is untranslatable. Especially he said, the third stanza, which is the most famous line in all of Korean literature. He said that this was an untranslatable line. That line is, that's a line that every Korean student knows how to recite because it's so famous. So we are going to try to translate that. Isn't, uh, isn't that exciting? That professor was a bit of a nationalist and uh, 
I'll get into, I'll get into that a bit later. Can we scroll down, please, just a little bit? Yes, thank you. Oh, oh no, no, no. Can you go down a bit? No. Oh, sorry. Can you go up a bit? <laughs> oh God. That crypt translation, Google Translate. Just show just show that part. Yes, thank you. So, um, what is a crypt translation? It is kind of like a direct translation or a literal translation that we provide. <clears throat> that a co-translation co-translator provides so that the the other side of the, co the, the another co-translator can create that into um, modern English or beautiful English or uh, and uh, there are many many problematic kind of like dynamics in, in this kind of co-translation dynamic with using crypt translations but we won't get into, get into that today but for the purposes of this uh, workshop where where uh, we have uh, translators who do not um, speak Korean, we kind of have to uh, use crypt translation, translations. And uh, so everyone tells me that machine translation is going to take over my job. Let's see how well it does. So um, let's look at what Google Translate has made of this translation. It goes, I'm sick of seeing when you go, I'll send you silently. Yaksan into Yongbyon, azalea flower. It will be rooted on the way to beautiful picking, walking, the flower that was placed. Please step on it lightly. I'm sick of seeing when you go, even if I die, I will shed tears. So obviously <laughs> it's total nonsense. Um, so this is, there's a kind of like, we're, we're not supposed to have machine translation replace us, but they're supposed to help us. But unfortunately, Korean to English translation is nowhere near even that level of being helpful to uh, translators. Uh, despite all of like the big deal people have made about neural networks, like it frankly isn't there yet. Um, there's a very long and complicated and involved kind of explanation for this, so which if you would like, then you can ask me in the Q&A later and I'll try to answer to the best of my abilities. But uh, some of you in the audience will say, well, that's Google Translate. Everyone in Korea land, in the shared parasite universe that we call Korea, everyone knows that no one uses Google Translate for Korean to English translation. Everyone uses neighbor Papago. Okay, so let's see how uh, neighbor Papago does. Can you scroll up or down? Can you say scroll up or down? Anyway, yes, thank you very much. So neighbor Papago translates this as, I'm sick to look at. When you go, I'll send you without saying a word. A weak mountain in Yongbyon, weak sand in Yongbyon. Uh, azalea flowers, I'll sprinkle it on the way to pick up the beauty. A pacing step, a flower out. Take it easy and step on it. Okay, someone is playing me. I'm sick to look at when you go, no, I'll cry if I die. Um, someone's playing music. Waiting, it's you. I'm muting you. Okay. That's my friend waiting. She has very creative children. Okay, so the neighbor Papago translation is not any better. Uh, but it is uh, clearly a bit different from, from the Google Translate. Um, so what we have to do is we have to create a crypt translation for the machine translators. So uh, let me just show you what this means. Can you scroll down a bit more? Just one more section. Yes, thank you. So yes, machine translation crypt, yes. So with the machine translation crypt, you see that uh, the modern Korean translation of the poem is on the left and the machine crib that I created is on the right. You can see that I added some words in red. Those are the words that I added and I got rid of the enjambments. Enjambments are of course like line breaks in poems so that the stanzas look like this and not like this. I wish I could use my mouse to show you but every time I do one of these lectures <laughs> Those screen share always like um, breaks down. Okay, so uh, if you look at the words that are in red, there are mostly 당신이, 당신들, 내가, 내가. These are uh, subjects because in Korean, in the Korean language, and I have to lecture a little bit about the Korean language, in the Korean language, you can cancel the subject. This is something that um, machine languages are kind of like really bad at. They can't look at a Korean sentence and go, oh, the erased subject is you, not me or him, not her, she, not he. Like they're very bad at that kind of guessing. They're getting better. But uh, as you can probably see from the mess from above, uh, they're, so they're not uh, <laughs> there yet. So, so we have to kind of like pad everything, like give them every single 
<clears throat> subject, cancel subject, and every single canceled particle. This is a very unnatural way for Koreans to actually speak. This is this is not what natural uh, natural language Korean sounds like. But um, I think if we feed this machine language crib to the machine translators uh, and ask them to translate this into English, they will do a better job. So let's see if they did a better job. Can we scroll down, please? One more section. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, on the left. Uh, we fed the crib translation of the machine translation into Google Translate. Let's see what it says. When you go away, because you are disgusted with me, I will send you silently. I picked the azalea flowers in Yaksan Yongbyon and I will sprinkle them on your way. Please gently step on the flower in your steps. When you go away, because you are disgusted with me, even if I die, I will not cry. So at least we have a coherent not quite poem, maybe it is a poem, but we, we get images, we get metaphors, we get a logical kind of flow. Not that all poems have to have logical flow. I'm not that much of a barbarian. Let's see what neighbor Papago has made uh, on the right. I'll let you go without saying a word when you leave because you're disgusted to see me. I will pick an armful of azalea flowers in Yaksan Yongbyon and sprinkle them on your way. Gently tread on the flower on your way. When you leave because you're sick to see me, I'll cry if I die. Even in this bad machine translation, uh, it's, it's still a very moving poem and um, kind of almost wants to make me cry. Why don't we do a comparison of the Google Translate and of the neighbor Papago and kind of like look at how differently um, these two machines uh, translated the same poem, the same crib. So let's do it. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, stanza by stanza. When you go away because you are disgusted with me, I will send you silently. Versus, I'll let you go without saying a word when you leave because you're disgusted to see me. Note that Google said that it was uh, put you being disgusted with me as the front part of the stanza and I will send you silently as the back part. Whereas neighbor put uh, being disgusted with me as the second part of the sentence of the stanza, and I'll let you go without saying a word as the first part. So they actually had different strategies in positioning the, um, the language. <clears throat> you could kind of argue that, uh, so you can kind of argue that Google Translate is more accurate because in the Korean, so uh, the part of, of the speaker being, uh, the part of the speaker's lover being disgusted is first. And so, okay, so Google Translate kind of like managed to maintain this word order, whereas Neighbor didn't. Neighbor put it like, like that. So does that make Neighbor's translation not as good as Google? Well, not necessarily, because you can kind of argue that the, the sort of point of the stanza is not so much that um, I will go without a word, but the fact that the lover is disgusted to see me. I think that's kind of like the kind of shock in the, in the stanza. <clears throat> the uh, Kim Sowar, the author of this uh, poem, I feel like he started with the image, the shocking image of that of the lover being disgusted because he kind of wanted to hook in uh, the, the reader, whereas I think uh, if, if you were to translate this, for example, and you translated it the way Neighbor translated it and put the disgust at the end, that's also a very valid strategy because you're kind of like setting up the situation in the beginning and then boom, like this twist at the end or this like kind of like burst of disgust at the, at, at the end. And uh, I think that kind of like makes people want to read the next sentence. This is something that uh, Lee Child, the uh, thriller writer has talked about. He said that if you want to create three dimensional exciting prose that people keep, want to, keep wanting to read, you should kind of like set up something intriguing and then boom, set up something intriguing, boom, set up something intriguing, boom. And always find like the weight of the sentence, the, the interesting part of the sentence, the, the payload and put it in the back whereas try to be very mysterious and intriguing in the front. And he does that on the sentence level as well as of course on the book level, this is also a way of like form following function and function following form. Okay, um, so that's, that's an, another difference between these two translations that I want to pick out is in the second stanza. I picked the azalea flowers in Yaksan Yongbyon and I will sprinkle them on your way. 
I will pick an armful of azalea flowers in Yaksan Yongbyon and sprinkle them on your way. So they both decided to basically keep the word order uh, and also sprinkle them on your way is like, you know, the same for both sentences. Very interestingly, neighbor Papago used the word armful. In the Korean, they do say, uh, uh, they, um, well, they, that's, that's correct. Um, <laughs> Kim Soo says han arum, and that literally means an armful. This is a poem about sending away your lover. Uh, so Google decided that uh, this armful imagery is not, is not important, but neighbor, <laughs> may have decided that it was because, you know, it's your lover, you want to grab onto them, you don't want them to turn away in disgust. Although this poem says that I will send you on your way without saying anything, but is that what it's really saying? Is it really actually, is it an expression of being cool about it? Or is it an expression of like total despair uh, but you know, saying it in in a way, <laughs> saying the opposite, but but meaning the opposite thing, kind of like you know, you ought to know by Alanis Morissette, I guess. Although, oh no, is that correct? I I feel like she was she was generally disgusted. But if you're that disgusted with your lover, then you know you you forget them. You don't write a hit song about them. And I think that's kind of like it's kind of implied that um sorry, both Kim Soo and Alanis Morissette, uh, Kim Soo speaker and Alanis Morissette, while they are angry or whatnot, they still kind of feel like, they still feel uh, a kind of regret or a kind of like sadness that their lover is about to bail on them. Let's go to the third stanza really quickly. Um, Please gently step on the flower in your steps. Gently tread on the flower on your way. It says step in the Google, but tread in the neighbor Papago. Uh, so remember that word tread because uh, it's, it's it's an uh, important little clue that's, that's a bit later. But let's also think about these words as they are. Step is kind of abstract, you know? It's a, there are many, a step could be hard, a step could be soft, a step could be like, or a step could be like, you know, you know like a light-footed person like me. Uh, whereas tread is very clearly stomping on something, you know, like, like, you know, you're really gonna tread on the flowers that your ex-lover put down. And so it's a very dramatic kind of imagery. So I think um, Naver's choice, word choice here is better than Google Translate. Although there are, there are certain merits to the Google Translate. Okay, so let's scroll down a bit more. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, so finally, human translations. Uh, on the left is my translation of this poem that I kind of did on the back of the envelope. And on the right is uh, the poetry translator, Jack Jung, who um, did his translation probably with more care than I did. So let's kind of like read both and, um, and discuss how they're kind of different and like different kind of translation choices that we both made as translators. So uh, here's mine, azaleas. When you leave me because I disgust you, I'll send you gently on your way. An armful of azaleas from Yaksan Mountain in Yongbyon, I shall drop on your path. Smear lightly with each step you lay on my blossoms as you walk away. When you leave me because I disgust you, my tears I'll not shed even in death. Uh, I should probably say, that this line, when you leave me, was inspired by um, Wei Ting, who is in uh, this uh, workshop, I'm very glad to say, because uh, she has written a beautiful novel about Korea, and it's titled, it takes its title from uh, this poem, in fact, and it's titled, When You Turn Away. And I thought, wow, that is a great title. That is a great translation of this, of this um, poem. Uh, but I chose, uh, but so I kind of borrowed from kind of like that energy a little bit when you leave me and when you turn away. Although of course her title is much more romantic. But uh, I thought I would do this, uh, in, I'm kind of a conservative translator in the Korean. So I decided to go with when you leave me, which is a bit more direct than when you turn away. Although if I also wrote a book, I would title it when you turn away, not when you leave me. <laughs> okay, so here is uh, Jack Jung's um, poem, Jindale. Once I am shaped as the reason of your disgust, pushing you towards somewhere not here, there will be no words, my letting go enduring grace, graciously. On a hill where herbs grow in Yongbyon province, Jindale flowers are blossoming. And here I have brought an armful I plucked to scatter them before you. 
as you take those steps away from here, and for each you take a flower, will need to be crushed. So take care to tread lightly as you leave me be. In the shape of who I am that disgusts you so, pushing you towards somewhere not here, and though this may be my death, no, tears won't flow where I am. Beautiful, gorgeous translation by Jack Johnson. So, what do you think are the differences between our translation styles? Like, what is a really obvious difference that you see? You can just like write it into the chat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, length. Uh, length is, oh, metrics is also very, very excellent. Yes. Um, words, absolutely. Form. Mm -hmm. Oh, could I read the full poem in Korean? I may not have the time. There are many, many, um, I think there are many YouTube videos where, where they do it. Repetition from the first stanza. Oh, very good, very good. Yes, uh, very, we, oh, we have a very, um, we have a lot of close to readers in the audience today that are, uh, they're, they're very, um, they're very excellent. Yes, oh, sorry, Johanna. Uh, normally I would, but I think we're a little short on time. So, um, so length, obviously. Um, Jack is more prosy than I am. This is not bad. Um, I simply believe that poems should be uh, the language should be kind of like, should be compact because that's the way I was very conservatively educated here in conservative South Korea. Uh, Jack, who had a more progressive and frankly better education, uh, decided to play with it more and to sort of like make it more longing kind of because you want your, you don't want your lover to leave. So you're going to keep talking to keep them in place. Whereas with me, it's kind of like kind of pithy for someone who doesn't want their lover to leave them. So that's a big thing. You can see also that the title is different, right? So yes, uh, Babs, very good. Keeping Azaleas in Korean transliteration. This is kind of um, is a very controversial issue in, trans in the world of literary translation right now, which is domesticization versus foreignization. Foreignization means maintaining sort of like the foreign quality of a text. Uh, for ex like here, like chindale, that is the Korean word for azaleas. And there are arguments to and for against foreignization. Uh, against is that because they, it makes the text less accessible to people who are not familiar with the source culture. But for is um, because if you domesticize a text, it, it's kind of like a colonial sadejui, kind of like you are trying to pander and cater to the uh, to the Western gaze. And so in order to not do that, we try to leave as many foreignized, foreignized elements as possible. There are some translators who are really, really great at doing this. For example, Arunava Sinha is uh, uh, like all of his translations kind of like preserve the quality of uh, Bangla. And yet they, you kind of like don't have a problem reading all of these like Bangla transliterations in his text because he glosses so subtly. And whereas I'm kind of, I guess, I'm very over enthusiastic and lazy, so I tend to domesticize a bit. And that's kind of what I'm, I'm known for as a literary translator. Um, both approaches have their pros and cons. Uh, we won't get into too much of a discussion there. And um, what's another difference that uh, people, metric. Okay, so the Korean language oh, doesn't have metric. I mean, it, kind of does, but not like it does in English. English metric is because uh, Eng English words, for English words, the accented syllable is so important. Like the word content and content are spelled the same, but they mean completely, they don't mean anything the same, right? Uh, you can have content content, but you can't have content content, for example. So, uh, so you kind of have, you can play with metrics a bit more in English and obviously Jack has done that. Whereas uh, I'm kind of like, uh, no, it's, it's not something that's in the source. So I'm not going to like work that hard <laughs> because again, <laughs> I'm lazy. Um, so those are some of the kind of like different things that you can do in your translation of this poem. And yes, this is the poem that I'm going to ask you to translate. I'm going to ask you to look at uh, all of the cribs, all of the crib translations on this website so that you can kind of like maybe combine them or like come up with your own way of saying something. You can kind of like put it in action sequence or like 
put in photography, oh, don't put in photography because that'll be very difficult for me to present next week, <laughs> but <laughs> you can like add a, a whole stanza. I don't know, like you can kind of like, um, <clears throat> if you want a really easy way to, to make it a different translation, you can kind of do those things. But I kind of encourage you to use the crypt translations and kind of like pretend that you understand Korean and translate accordingly, because I think uh, you will find, we, we're gonna find some really kind of interesting um, variations on that. Okay, um, can we scroll down a little bit? Yes, so thank you. So uh, this is Peje Hakdang, which is uh, the oldest brick building in South Korea. Um, it's a school and it's the school that Kim so was educated in, the author of this poem. And I went there on a tour and the tour guide said like, oh, we have Kim Sool's like, oh, you guys are literary translators. So we have Kim Sool's like notebooks, we have his textbooks. And you know, like that poem, Jindale, Azalea's, like we have that Yates poem that he copied that line from. What did you just say to me? He said, yeah, that's from a Yates poem. So this, this line, <laughs> That is supposedly, that, that is the most famous line in all of Korean literature, right? And, it, and that cannot possibly be translated into a language outside of the Korean language is in itself a translation. So um, I did some research into this and it, it's not quite as the tour guide said, I described it, but uh, let me show you, it's, 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 let me show you what I, uh, what I found. So scroll down a little bit more. This is not like some kind of AS5 possession moment, by the way. This is not my discovery. Like many Korean scholars have discovered this. But um, so here, this is a uh, Yeats uh, poem called Eighth, sorry, um, sorry to the Irish people. I don't know how to pronounce this word. Eighth wishes for the cloths of heaven. Let me read it to you. Had I the heavens uh, embroidered cloths and wrought with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and the half light, I would spread the cloths under your feet, but I being poor have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly because you tread on my dreams. The first book of um, Western, Western poetry translated into Korean was done by Kim so -wol, Kim so -wol's, uh, teacher at Peje Hakdang. And his translation is on the right. I hunted it down and I got a screenshot of the, of the poem on the left's translation into Korean. This is the first time that it was translated into Korean. And um, it doesn't say but it uses this image of, you know, tread softly for you uh, because you're, you know, spreading something under the feet of the lover as they tread on, you know, their dreams. So, and I just wanted to hunt down this LTI, <laughs> this LTI Korean professor and like rub this in his face because apparently he did not know that the most famous Korean line in all of Korean poetry that, uh, and that he claimed could not be translated was actually a translation in itself. Um, can we scroll down a little bit more? <clears throat> However, <clears throat> sorry. However, <laughs> In preparing for this workshop, I made an additional discovery. And this is a discovery from Dr. Inmoku at Yonsei University. Um, it's somewhere in the middle of this giant block of text. Kim's translation of Yeats's poem was, however, indirect translation with Japanese translation, including those by Kuriyagawa Hakuson as original scripts. What Kim did was relay translation. So the, the translation above, the Kimok translation is actually a translation from a Japanese translation of Yates. Do you see the four people like below that quote? So on the left, it's Yates. Uh, second from the left is uh, Kuriyagawa Hakusan, I believe. Um, second from the right is Kimok, who was Kim so teacher and Kim so is on the far right. So basically the poem that you see is kind of like a translation of a translation of a translation. Is that correct? It's not just a, 
it's not just taken from a translation. It's not a rewriting of a translation. It's a translation of a translation of a translation. And if you think about it, Yeats, you know, he's Irish. He's not English. He's writing in his colonizer's language. So you can kind of argue that he's also translating, which would make this a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation. And so <laughs> the most, again, the most famous line in all of Korean poetry is from a translation. What is literary translation? This is literary translation. <laughs> it creates 10,000 readers, 10,000 meanings. It creates, it is a creator of meanings. It is a creator of poetry. It is a creator of all the beautiful stars in the literary sky. And now it's your turn to do something with the translation of this poem. I want you guys to look at all of the crib translations on this page, which we will share with you uh, somewhere on the chat or somewhere, and kind of like go through it uh, with your breakout groups and um, kind of discuss like, like how you would translate. Let's just concentrate on that one line, that third stanza about treading softly. Are you going to use the Yeats poem are you going to use Papago's or Google Translate? Or are you going to come up with a completely different line? So in your breakout groups, kind of like discuss that and, and tell me how you would do it. And um, after this session, uh, I want you guys to, I want everyone to kind of like create their own translation of the poem and then use the website to mail it to me because there will be a, there's a mail form at the very, at the very bottom of this, of this um, uh, website. And then next week I will present all of the, um, uh, I will present the translations and kind of like do a comparison reading. Um, there was one more thing. Oh yeah, so, so if you have any question, uh, questions, um, please uh, ask me at the end of, at the end of your breakout groups. I think that's how it works, right? Okay, so breakout. Ask me any question you like, uh, anything about the, the translation, the poem, um, life as a translator, life as a Korean translator, how do I, how do you get a grant, anything you would like, uh, either in the chat room or out loud, I guess. Yeah, so, so uh, um, do you pop, do you pop um, question into the chat or um... There should be a raise hand function, or you can just switch your camera on and wave. Um, Derek's um, popped a question into the chat. How does your specific linguistic bank background influence you in your approach to translation? Mm, interesting question. I started off, <coughs> so I started off as one of those many, many like, you know, you know, little children who translate for their parents because I was raised overseas. Um, I am, actually not an immigrant. I live in Korea. I am Korean, a Korean citizen. I don't have citizenship anywhere else in the world. And my parents went overseas for work. And then we came back when I became, uh, and when I went to college and I've lived my entire adult life here in, in Korea and now I'm 40. So, uh, so what you're hearing is basically my, my second language. The, um, how does it influence my approach to translation? So I think it's not so much that aspect that uh, influences my translation actually, but the fact that I kind of started off as an interpreter before I became a translator. A translator is someone who does translation on paper. An interpreter is someone who does translation using their voice, right? Like it's spoken translation. And so I think I tend to gravitate towards Korean works that are very, very colloquial or written in a very kind of like colloquial language. Um, whereas I know a lot of other translators who would translate for things that I probably would not like, um, like very, very dense classics or, um, or kind of older writers tend to write more writerly in, in a more writerly way. And I, I don't quite gravitate towards towards those writers so much. And I feel like both my Korean and my English when I, when I write are very, very kind of colloquial, except when I did legal translation because law is actually my background and 
And for that, there's like a whole like nomenclature that you need to learn, a whole kind of like way of speaking that you need to learn. And I think, so there I was more conscious about being more written in my language, but I definitely think that that's kind of like what distinguishes me from, from other translators in that I used to be an interpreter and that's kind of how I translate to this day. Jennifer, yes, absolutely. Do open your microphone. Um, hello. Um, my English is not very good, so I will try my best. Um, when you translate um, a poem or maybe a romance, if you have some um, cultural aspect that something that you are sure that in other countries they have no idea what this is, how you do it? You put a note on the text, you try to insert something on the, the text, like, oh, for, ex for um, I don't know if it's a good example, but for example, uh, Bantiha, like the same basement. Oh, Bantiha is this, 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 or, oh, they live in the same basement that the um, Korean architecture sort of thing. How you do it? Yeah, that's a really great example, Bantiha. Um... I do the second thing that you mentioned. I kind of explain it in the text um, because, okay. so this is more of a, uh, it's more of like a tradition. It's like kind of like a way of that when you're translating into English, it's, a, it's something that they encourage you to do to gloss, you know, you know, we call it glossing. And it's really funny because now I'm, now I'm translating a book from uh, English into Korean. I'm translating Ocean Wong's Night Sky with Exit Wounds into Korean. And I realized that, oh, Korean has different tradition and I can use footnotes and endnotes. And I'm like, I'm gonna go crazy putting all of these footnotes and endnotes and I'm just gonna have so much fun doing all of this, you know, I don't have to gloss anymore. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, it's that strategy tends to be determined by the editor and not so much the translator. But I have found that um, for, for the US and the UK, they don't like to use endnotes or footnotes. They kind of want you to gloss, they kind of, uh, but, the other, but the other kind of odd kind of trend that goes against not using endnotes or footnotes is that they also kind of want you to foreignize now. Like now that's a thing where you just leave the source language transliterated in the text or even like, you know, it's spelled the way that it is in, in, the, uh, in the source text, which I don't know how that would work for Korean or Japanese. That would frankly kind of mess up the type, the type, the type setting, but you know, it's, it's not my job to worry about the type setting. And, um, but, I, but you know, I mean, Spanish, Italian, French translators have done that since time immemorial. So why can't we do that is kind of like the thinking behind that, I think. And yeah, I'm, I'm for that as well. But um, I also would like my readers to, because to, to understand what they're reading, because sometimes, sometimes that's important to do. Like panja is very, very important. And sometimes panja is not important. Like you can, you can just say it's a, it's a basement apartment. <laughs> yeah. And, and describe there's like a window, like I think there's a British word for it too. And you know, it's not like there's anywhere in the world where a basement apartment is like the exclusive kind of thing. I think it's universally recognized that if you have an apartment in the basement, it's not great. So it kind of have, I kind of have to, I kind of pick my battles when it comes to that. And I kind of also very lazily, because I'm very lazy, I leave it to the editor to kind of like make that kind of decision. Okay, thanks. That was a great question. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, yeah, it's such, such an, I'm always fascinated by that question of how you, um, how you deal with those, that sort of cultural transfer. Um, and I think it's, it's really, it's really good to bring in that, um, the role of the editor and, the, and the, pub, the publisher at that point. Is it, Anton, is it something that you, you know, do you talk to the editor at the beginning of the process about, you know, sort of general questions, or is it that, they, it comes it comes up with specific examples towards the end of the once you've submitted your translation. Um, I think both. Really interesting thing is every publisher is kind of different. Like they they all have their house style, 
for example, um, publisher I won't name, uh, <laughs> like they kind of like insisted I domesticize a lot of things. And I'm like, okay, I mean, it's, it's your house. I just live here. And um, recently I was working with Grove Atlantic in America who is doing Love in the Big City by Sanyang Park coming out this November. Uh, it'll be published in the UK by Tilted Access, also coming out in November. Uh, so Grove Atlantic was, would actually change things that I had translated into English back into Korean. And they did that a couple of times. And the editor is not even Korean. <laughs> uh, for example, I always, I always use this example. Like uh, I said, side, oh, they, they put out the side dishes. And he's like, side dishes? This is a Korean restaurant. Isn't this banchan? And I was like, wow, you know banchan? And he's like, yeah, just put in banchan, if that's what it is. I said, okay, I'll just put in banchan. And you can kind of get it contextually, but like that's what they're, um, that, 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 that's what they're eating. So that was like a very like kind of wow moment for me. And um, like Curse Bunny was the same way, uh, Onward Star is the same way, and Tilted Axis is the same way. And like when, when Deborah Smith did it, um, like she would unitalicize words that I italicized. And I was like, oh, it's so nice having a Korean, like working with a Korean translator as your editor. And, uh, and I think that was also a part of, but she's also very kind of like anti-colonial and very, um, very kind of like wanting to not uh, create a translation that is very, you know, Western gazy. And uh, I learned a lot about, about doing that from her as well as doing feminist translation. And so I think, yeah, it's, it's really, really interesting that what editors kind of, what, what editors bring to the table. I think it's, um, you, I learn a lot as a translator and I learn a lot as a writer and it's, um, it's a very amazing group of people. I think it's also about having faith in or with your reader as well isn't it and kind of um yeah expecting a certain a certain enge engagement from them rather than sort of telling that if thinking that they need to be told everything or need, need to have everything explained to them i think there's that relationship comes yeah, into absolutely. it as well um kristen had a question i think hi um so my question is, I have a lot of questions because this is kind of my first introduction to literary translation, um, but what is your responsibility to the source text when you're translating? And then what elements make a good translation and how do you determine, like how do you know what kind of liberties you can take when you're translating? Yeah, thank you very much. This is the question in literary translation. And I have no answer for that because it's going to be different for not, not just every book that you do, but also like every sentence, every word. It's kind of like, am I allowed to do this? Or am I not allowed to do this? What I come, the attitude that I come up against the most here in South Korea specifically is that people are very, very, especially um, professors, Korean professors, are very, very kind of hostile towards translators in that, oh, you are not allowed to do this. You are not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to translate this way. You're not allowed to translate that way. <clears throat> and I once had a student, this is not a student that I picked. Uh, I had to kind of like uh, work, I had to kind of like fly into a, a classroom setting where the instructor had quit and the students that he had picked were kind of like sitting there and I had to teach them. <clears throat> and one of them was like, how could you like allow that kind of translation? Like you don't have the license to do it. And I'm like, who is the licensing authority who's gonna tell me that they're gonna revoke my license? Like, <laughs> I have transatlantic N grants. I don't need your license. And the fact that she said that to me was really interesting because she was a student and I was a professor and basically it was like uh, her rejection of my authority and her assertion of her authority and she was leaning her authority on the source text and her idea of what um, basically what you know the reader would find acceptable and I'm like 
that's all very it's it's all very fine and well to think about the reader but you also have to be able to articulate your choices and it has to be more than oh it's like this in the source or oh i'm doing a direct translation no you have to be able to justify your choices other which is other than i am leaning on this authority to have the authority <laughs> to translate right you're the translator you have the authority to change things and if you don't like that responsibility or you can't take that on, then I don't know, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to, to be a literary translator because the way that publishing in the West works is very different from the way that it works in, in Korea. Like you could be a very, very kind of rough, in Korea, you could, you could be very literal and all you have to do is just say, oh, the source says this and then it's game over. But uh, in the West, they value um, things being a bit more polished, a bit more readable, a bit more accessible. Uh, it's more commercial, it's more capitalist. And um, you kind of have to find like your middle ground between that. Obviously you should not like fly off the handle, like, you know, Nabokov's pale fire. I mean, but, <laughs> but you should, you know, um, you kind of have to take responsibility for some of the choices that you make in your translation that will diverge from the source. And that's just like on you as the translator. And you can't lean on these, uh, these phantom authority figures because they're not there to defend you. I don't know if that's helpful. But... It was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Yeah, I think it's the, the responsibility of the translator is such an important idea, isn't it? And it's also where a lot of the pleasure comes from, I think from that, you know, from kind of taking on that responsibility, but it, um, it does need to be understood as a responsibility, nonetheless. Um, Kristen, just to say with your other questions, I think we probably won't have time today, but um, do you come to one of the other events during residency and there'll be other Q&A opportunities. Um, so so do, uh, do you hang on to your questions. Um, Sah Saha Otmani. Hello, hi. Hi. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for this. Yes, hi, Anton. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. I have a question that is conveniently on topic. I did not see this coming. It's on indirect translation. Um, so uh, when it comes to indirect translation from languages like Korean into a language like Arabic, which are pretty much on both ends of the margin um, using you know, English, I've, I've often been faced with the question of what is exactly my source text? Sometimes there is, there is that notion of wanting to kind of um, do justice and take responsibility and, and give more visibility to the um, to the Korean text, but at the same time, you know, my source text is very often, or not often, it is always um, English. And, and so I wanted to kind of know your take on indirect translation, especially that it's pretty much on the rise here in the Arab world um, into Korean because we don't have enough literary Korean translators. Um, and people are much more interested in the culture than they've ever been before due to very obvious reasons. And so that's uh, my question. And in regards to the, the whole publishing scene uh, uh, from your experience, you know, there is this uh, ideal kind of notion of elective affinity where you get to translate whatever it is that you, that you seem to develop an affinity towards. And I was wondering if that's just a, a pink fantasy of ours uh, or is that you know, possible. <laughs> Those are my questions. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you for your very great questions. Um, so the second one, right off the bat, um, most translate. I'm very lucky. Um, I think I have got to choose most of what I wanted to translate, except for one book, which I never should have done. I did it for money, and it's not for good reason, especially to translate literature for money. I mean, that's so redundant. Like I should have just gotten a real job. Um, but uh, many of the, especially prolific translators that I see, I feel, uh, the ones that have to make that 100% that make a living through translation. I mean, I, so do I, but, but, but the ones who are even more prolific than I am, not that I'm super prolific. Like if you, I mean, they don't love every book that they translate. They kind of like sometimes have to take on work that books that they are not 100% with, but they find a, because they're, but they're so professional that they just find a way to like the book and to approach the book and to try and do like the voice and so on. So you can make it into an interesting exercise. Absolutely. 
and and I and I don't like you know I'm not gonna be like oh like you someone gave you a book you know oh like you're not a real literary translator no <laughs> sometimes those jobs are can be really really interesting and really really um like great for you as a translator not just in terms of money but also in terms of like the experience and the access and the network so I kind of like if you have an opportunity I totally encourage you to to pursue it regardless of whether you chose the book or not. Um, what was the first part? Like you said something about oh, indirect translation. Um, yeah, you're taking general. Yeah, so you've probably detected from my lecture that I'm not like 100% <laughs> approve of it. Mm -hmm. But um, I think uh, in the case like Korean and Arabic, I think especially Korean, there, there, there is such a huge kind of just need for um, people who can speak both languages, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, the, there's, there are like a couple of schools in Korea that teach Arabic, a couple of schools in Seoul, and the, the, the one that the, the more exclusive program, which is at HUPS, um, if you are like the number one graduate from the Arabic department, you kind of like automatically get a job in the government. <laughs> that's how much, that's how much in demand Arabic translators are. And like, if there are any like Korean Arabic translators out there trying to get into literature, I may be able to look you up. Because, up, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like LTI Korea, you know, they're gonna they're gonna like swoop in and like <laughs> give you a, if you can find a if you can find an Arabic uh, publisher for for a Korean book and you can translate it and you can prove that you can translate them, they will totally mm -hmm. give you money for it. Um, indirect translations, so they're kind of like a last resort thing, um, but uh, like there there's there are all these interesting things where I think. Um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez said that the Gregory Rabassa version of 100 Years of Solitude is better than his mm -hmm. original. And I think in cases like that, you can kind of argue that it's okay. Um, but in Korea, the thing about indirect translation is that it has that veneer of colonialism because our mm -hmm. indirect translations are mostly from Japanese, or they were at the time. Mm -hmm. and and to this day, there's like a, a stigma when it comes to indirect translations. So I, and I kind of like feel the same way. At the same time, I am o emotionally okay with people translating from my English translation into an, a different translation because I'm not a perfect, great, flawless translator, but I feel like the authors that I pick are great, perfect, flawless writers. <laughs> and their literature will shine through my translation despite its flaws and despite my mistakes and misreadings. And even if they are mistakes and misreadings, they'll be interesting enough to the reader for them to go with it. So consciously, officially, I disapprove of indirect translations, but emotionally, I'm like, yeah, translate my translation, go for it. <laughs> Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> I have very complex feelings on this issue, but yeah, great question. Everyone does, trust me. Don't, don't worry about it. I'm doing it and I'm still like not sure about it. So <laughs> mm. <laughs> really great questions. Thank you so much. Um, it's really nice that this is the first of a series of events because often we get to the end, most of our events are standalone and often we get to the end and we, you know, we're so aware that there are so many more questions to be asked and so much more of a discussion to have. So it's really nice that this is um, the, the beginning of this conversation with, with Anton um, and, and I'm so grateful for such a, um, such a lively um, presentation from you, Anton, and 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 such great um, responses from everybody. Um, I am going to try sharing my screen and um, just so that I can talk through what happens next with the residency. Can you see the residency web web page now? Um, okay, that's today. So on Thursday, um, we have a reading um, with Bora Chung and Anton. Um, I like this, and possibly other works in other languages. So one of the great, um, the great things about having Bora Chung as our, a resident author is that she is a translator herself. Um, and so I think that's, that's gonna generate some really interesting um, discussions uh, with, with Anton. So that's happening on Thursday at 12.30. Um, then next Monday, there are two events. Um, one is just um, going to be a link to a recorded conversation between Bora Chung and Anton. 
Um, and then there is a talk that Anton is given, giving um, with OCCT, which is Oxford Comparative Criticism and Translation, um, which is another um, Oxford University organization. And that's part of Oxford Translation Day, um, which this year is events spread over several days. Um, and the website link is there. And then we get to Wednesday, the 2nd of June, which is the second part of um, what we've started today. So Anton, did you just want to say a couple of things about, about that to everybody? Um, about the, the OCCT talk? No, no, about coming back together on Wednesday the 2nd. Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, there's a submission form at, uh, again, there's a submission form at the bottom and just like, send me your, your translations of, of the poem based on like the different cribs that are on that page. And basically what I'll do is I will kind of like talk about each translation or as many translations as I can and kind of like discuss like the different, um, the different issues in translation. I'm not going to do something like rank them or say, oh, this is a wrong translation or right translation. That's not an interesting conversation. An interesting conversation is one where like, oh, look at this interesting choice that this translator did. Oh, look at that interesting choice. Let's discuss that and like why they would make that kind of, of choice. Like that's the kind of like discussion that uh, I'm kind of looking forward to at this workshop. So in order for that to happen, I need to have your translation. So please submit a lot of translation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, so um, I've put that up on the screen. Um, it's at the bottom of the webpage um, that you that you all have the link for now. Um, and I guess even just one one line is uh, is enough, right, Anton? It doesn't need to be. Yes, yes, it and, could be just that stanza. Yeah, yeah, and and definitely not not polished. It's about kind of providing material for, for discussion. So, so don't hold back from that. Uh, or when do you need the translations by, Coraline asks. Oh, um, I will probably take a look at them. Uh, let's say, let's say um, just like a day before. Okay, 24 hours before. We'll, we'll, um, we'll sp spread the word by Twitter and things as well to remind, to remind, remind people and email you all. Um, um, everybody that was here today. Um, if you, um, if there are others who were not able to come today, um, but but would like to take part, um, we'll make the recording available um, for today. So do do spread the word. Um, but otherwise, I think yeah, it just remains to say thank you so much again, Anton, for a really really great start to the residency. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again on Thursday for your um, talk with with Bora Chung. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you for welcoming me. This was really great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks everybody for taking part. Look forward to seeing you again. Welcome everybody. My name's Charlotte Ryland and I'm the founder and director of the Queen's College Translation Exchange. The Translation Exchange is based at Queen's College, which is a college of uh, Oxford University. And that's where I'm, I'm speaking from today. Uh, we set up the exchange in 2018 um, and our mission broadly is to bring people together originally in and around Oxford to read and share international literature and above all to translate together. We're convinced that translating together is one of the most powerful and enjoyable ways of engaging with literature. It's a really great way of opening um, people up to literatures that you wouldn't otherwise have access to um, because of language or geography. Um, and um, giving people the opportunity to share that literature with others. Um, it's also about raising the profile of international culture in this country. As I say, we started off um, thinking about this aim uh, as being to bring together people sort of within reach of Oxford. Of course, over a year ago now, um, it became irrelevant where people were geographically. Um, everything switched to where we are now on Zoom. And um, we've had a really wonderful time um, bringing people together to, to talk about literature, to translate together virtually, um, people from all over the world, as you can see in the chat, that's uh, the same the same today. Um, so um, we um, do our work uh, a few ways and we have a particular focus on young people. Um, we have an ambassador programme, hang on, there we go, um, um, which involves um, bringing 
training uh, university students to go into schools and run translation workshops. And here you can see um, a translation workshop with with ten year olds um, in in Oxford. Um, this year we've set up a prize for language learners at school called the Anthea, Anthea Bell Prize for Young Translators, um, which has involved um, tens of thousands of, of learners aged 11 to 18 in translating poetry, fiction and nonfiction in their classrooms with their teachers throughout the year or occasionally through in their homes when it was uh, when it was home learning. Um, we also have. Um, There's the Anthea Bell Prize. That, there's a, um, an example of some of the work that's come out of the Anthea Bell Prize this year. Mandarin and, uh, uh, idioms and um, French poetry. We also have um, an international book club that runs three times a year. This is, of course, on Zoom um, now. Um, and we invite the translator along for a Q&A um, and then go into breakout rooms, um, as we're probably going to do today, to discuss. Um, and hot off the press, is the news of our upcoming book club, um, which isn't even advertised on our website. You're hearing about it first. Um, Winter in Sokcho, um, keeping with the Korean theme. This is a, um, a book that's set in Korea, but actually written in French and translated from French into English by Anissa Abbas Higgins. Um, so they will be, oh dear, I think somebody needs to mute. Um, you will have the opportunity to um, sign up for that. Uh, it should be up later on today. We also run a book club for schools. Um, and the next meeting is on the 14th of July. Information about that is on our website as well. We run translation workshops and um, we've turned this residency into a Korean season um, because there were so there were so many interesting things going on that we wanted to um, to uh, acknowledge and, and, and work with. And um, we had the translator um, Mate Mandersloot run a workshop um, on the on the work of Che Young Gray um, earlier on this year. Um, which brings us on to our residency. So this is our first virtual residency. Um, and here you can see some pictures of previous in-person residencies. Um, we had a, a Galician language residency and then a Russian language residency last year. Um, and here is uh, Anton and author Bora Chung, who are our two residents um, this year. Of course, you're gonna see Anton in person today, so you don't really need that picture. Um, I think there are two main aims to our residencies. Um, on the one hand, it's about giving um, a, a translator and an author time and space to work together um, on a new translation. That's previously been something that's happened in Oxford. For the first time this year, that's going to continue to be happening um, in, on Zoom. Although I don't know, maybe Anton can say whether there's any in-person meetings happening with Bora at the moment. Um, but yes, to, so um, providing uh, the time and space for that. And then secondly, um, organizing events where the uh, translator and the author can present their work, can um, give people the opportunity to, to um, discover the work, to translate it themselves. Um, and that's what we're starting today. There's a third aim that we're adding this year, which keys into our focus on young people that I talked about, um, which is that um, every time there is a uh, residency from now on we will um, always make sure that it, um, it results in a in some teaching resources um, being made available to teachers across the UK and so Anton is going to be working with our colleague Ruth Akhmadzai Kemp on developing a Korean literature translation Korean literary translation teaching resource um, that that will be available um, next school year for teachers. Uh, we're very grateful to the Queen's College um, and to those who fund our work at the Translation Exchange and also to the Lit Literature Translation Institute Korea um, who are supporting this residency. These are um, ways that you can get involved in, um, in our work and I'll pop this up at the end as well with all the, all the links in case you don't, don't have it. <laughs> 